Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz pianist James Francis. He was encouraged by his parents to learn and revel in the rich Houstonian culture, exploring the arts and gaining early exposure to music and church, and through formal lessons he got at the age of five. While assimilating the contemporary music of his peers, he also developed a very distinct interest in jazz. At 22, he keeps moving forward. Since he's been in New York City, he has toured and recorded with the likes of Eric Harlan, The Roots, Jeff Tane Watts, Pat Matheny, Chris Potter, and fronts his own band, known as Kinetic. These days, he can often be seen on The Tonight Show, starring Jimmy Fallon on NBC with The Roots. He is currently promoting his recording debut album from Blue Note Records, and it is called Flight, released in 2018. He talked about quite a bit with Neon Jazz, so please get to know him and dig this young cat, my friends. James, thanks again for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Let's talk about the flight. This is a beautiful album. It's getting reviewed well. And and you are one of these cats on the scene that's just pushing jazz into that realm that's making a lot of people happy. Talk to me about this project, your artistic vision, and how you feel about it. Sure. Well, well, thank you for the uh, kind words, and uh, thanks for listening to it. Yeah, I mean, this whole record, basically just a culmination of all the different sounds and different ideas I've been having over the past few years, you know, since being in New York and even before. And, you know, with any movement, with any new sound that ever comes around, it's usually done with a group of people who are well-connected and they're, they're friends and, you know, have a lot of similarities and similar, you know, beliefs and wants. And uh, that's kind of what I did. You know, I, I got all my, basically my best friends in the room for a few days and, we made an album of music that we've been playing for a couple of years. You know, we've been playing some of the music for a second. And it just came together so naturally, just so organically. And, yeah, I was really happy the way it turned out. You represent this movement of jazz that's going into new directions. And it's just, it's just a rich, it's a continuance of a rich tradition of music. And my question to you is this. How healthy do you see jazz as being as we start 2019? I mean, I think it's, it's going in a great direction. I mean, you know, we've lost a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, the last couple of years. But, you know, there's a lot of new new sounds and people are thinking a little differently and uh, they're documenting it. And I think it's just now just making it more accessible to people who aren't as hip as the, you know, the jazz listener who knows all like a thousand records or something. You know, you got to you know, make it more available to the younger crowd or, you know, just people who don't know. You know, we have to be more inclusive, I I think. Do you see that happening? I think so, yeah. I mean, even the shows, you know, when I play in New York, you know, I'm seeing more and more younger people and I get a lot of younger people hitting me up online say how they didn't even know they liked jazz, which is, like, such a weird thing for me. Like, I, like, I get messages like that, like, like, every week, almost every day, where it's like, yeah, you know, I didn't know I liked jazz, but apparently I do, you know, because they go to iTunes and they say my album listen to jazz, and they'll hear, like, one of the songs, and it's like, yeah, I didn't know I liked jazz, but I just wish I could explain to people that when you say the word jazz, there's, like, so many little sub-genres and so much other, so many other sounds you can hear, you know, when you, based from when you say, like, oh, I like, um, like, rock music or something. You know, it's kind of... Yeah, you say jazz. There's so much under there. You know, you can hear Ben Webster, or you can hear um, Kirk Rosenwinkel, or John Coltrane. You know, they're all under that same umbrella. Or you can hear someone like Ben Wendell or Julian Lodge, which is all you know, which are almost genres in themselves. Like Nora Jones, or all these different contemporary people, but they're under the, the thing that says jazz, but it sounds so different. You know. Without a doubt. So let's go back to the beginnings of your life in Houston. You were really encouraged by your parents and the church. And talk to me about how you really did get into music and why it was at the piano and jazz. Well, I started playing piano when I was like around three or four years old. Um, that's kind of when I started um, taking lessons, maybe when I was five. And, um, yeah, my parents, they, they never forced me to do anything. It was just I naturally gravitated towards it and um I got, you know, training in classical and just fundamental training. And my dad, he's a big jazz fan. And um, 
you know, meet him, we'd be listening to records, or he would, whenever we'd be in the car or something, he'd throw on something, or, you know, we had a friend who was a, a radio host, actually, in Houston, and we used to go see him sometime, and he'd get us tickets to concerts, and, you know, I was always just kind of around it, you know, just this little kid, you know, trying to be cool with my dad, or, you know, we'd go to concerts and hear stuff, and I always wanted to just play it. I kept studying, and... I ended up going to this music program, uh, the Summer Jazz Workshop in Houston, which is a uh, it was a mecca for like music in Houston for younger for younger kids in the summer. And I went there, and then I met up with um, pianist Bobby Lyle, who was an incredible pianist, you know, organist, just all around amazing musician. And he taught me basically how to play this music, you know. And with him, you know, I study even more classical music and taught me standards and just the whole history. He's the one that kind of gave me the history lesson of jazz piano. And then from there, I went to um, the high school for the performing visual arts. And I was an um, even better version of study, you know, there with being able to play every day. You know, that high school was produced so many amazing musicians. And being able to go to that school, you know, I got a chance to, that's where I met the drummer on my record, Jeremy. And um, I met so many different people there. And it was just such a beautiful experience to be able to play every day. You play maybe three, four hours a day and working on original music. And I think from there, that's kind of where I started to find my musical. Well, not find it, but kind of start hinting at uh, what do I want to sound like, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. So when you finally made it to New York City, did you arrive? Was this always on your radar to get to New York? Absolutely, absolutely. I knew that before I even went to high school. You know, once you got there, was it a culture shock? How long did it take for you to really dive in? What was that early go in New York like for you? You know, fortunately, there's, like, a lot of people from Houston up here, you know, we're kind of like a family. So when I got up there, it, it wasn't too cold and lonely. You know, I had um, people looking out for me, like Jason Moran and, Robert Glass, you know, they've always been a part of my life, and they've always, you know, looked out for me. And um, Jeremy, my drummer, who I've been playing with for about 10 years now, which is crazy to say, and uh, he he was there. Um, I had a lot of friends already there, and uh, we just tried to continue what we were working on in Houston. So you are the youngest recipient of the American Federation of Musicians, the President's Youth Award. Mm -hmm. You've been recognized by Downbeat. You've gotten scholarships. At this point in your life, being where you're at at your age, you've gotten quite a few accolades. My question is this. I don't want to know your favorite one, but what, which one did you get that surprised you the most? I mean, I got a full ride to Berkeley, which was um, – it wasn't surprising, but I remember I, they, did, they held auditions in Houston. So I did the audition in Houston, and it was like maybe a couple minutes, and – they offered me like a full scholarship and everything, and it just, you know, it was kind of a surprise that I didn't go to Boston to do the audition, and I don't. It was never on my radar. It was kind of like a backup choice, but they were really nice and, you know, made calls to specifically to see if I was interested. So, you know, that was cool, but. Uh, for I, I don't really I, honestly I don't think about acc accolades that much. I just try to just keep creating, you know. But you know. and speaking speaking of creating, when you when you're around people like Jeff Tainbois, Pat Metheny, Chris Potter, when you look at them and watch how they play and watch what they've done over their career, do you see your future? Do you see things that they've done up to this point that you want to be a part of your lineage as you get older? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, all those names you mentioned, those are innovators. You know, you can hear how they've influenced people's way of playing, which is, to me, that's so special to be a person that you can go to almost any club anywhere and you, you're influenced on somebody, you know what I mean? Or you yeah. hear somebody, oh, yeah, they've checked out my records, or, yeah, they've been studying. It's like, oh, yeah, I do that thing. Yeah, I, I, I kind of implemented that style. You know what I mean? So... Someone like Pat, you know, he's influenced every guitar player on the music scene. And uh, someone yeah. like Jeff Tane, same thing. Every drummer is like, oh, yeah, Tane, 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 you know. 
and uh, just to be able to be around them. You know, I started playing with with Tay when I was like eighteen, nineteen, something like that. And um, that's almost. I feel like that's one of the bigger accolades is just to be on stage with him and and just learn all his music and you know just soak up and absorb all his knowledge. And he's somebody who knows so much music and he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy and very patient and nurturing. You know, I'm like Pat, who's like a you know Kansas City, you know Kansas City guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. It's the same the same thing, you know. We'll we'll sit around and talk for hours, and and he'll just tell me about just music. Period. You know how you know how he's turned down walk, working with Michael Jackson because how it, he didn't feel like it was the right fit for him, or how you say how he never want, how he stopped doing sideman gigs at a certain point, and how you know how his songwriting process and you know, just so much. You know, he's somebody who. He literally built his following from nothing. You know, he, he was telling me, you know, how they used to go on the road and just drive everywhere, you know, which is kind of a lost way of touring nowadays. But uh, he's like, yeah, you know, we used to, I bought a van and bought all the instruments and we just would drive from city to city and we just play. You know, just being around those type of people who who have all that experience, you know, just helps me put what I want to do into perspective and gives me a clear idea of which direction I'm headed in or at least hope to be headed in. You know, the other facet of you is you played with the Roots, you've been on The Tonight Show, and the thing that I always think about is, like, with Ernie Watts and Doc Severinsen, those guys yeah. had had to have learned a lot by being on a nightly bandstand under the bright lights of the nation. So my question to you is this. I think the common person thinks, oh, it's the house band. But you guys have to be up there pushing each other. There has to be a level of learning and repetition that makes you stronger as a musician. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I mean, any of that stuff, like when I like the TV stuff or the high pressure, like one shot, one take type stuff, definitely a different level of thinking to where it's like you have to do it the exact same. You know, you, every little thing under a microscope, you know, if something changes, like whoever you're playing by, they, they feel uncomfortable. They feel it, you know. You know, everything has to be precise. You know, it's like, oh, there's a 30-second playout. That has to be exact. You know, oh, going from here to here, that has to be, transition has to be smooth. You know, there's no, like, you, know, you can't really slide your way into some things, you know, but the roots there is such a, a band band. You know, there's, I mean, there's so much material and repertoire. You know, when I started stepping into that situation, you know, it was just me playing catch-up, you know, because they've been playing together for, like, 20 years or over 20 years. And uh, when I started coming in, it was just, I mean, they made it very easy because it's such a tight knit group. In terms of thinking, you're a better musician, absolutely. You know, your time has to be impeccable. You have to be able to play something verbatim from a record. It is high pressure, but at the same time, um, it's a very relaxed environment. So you've also been a part of the film score, Vincent of Roxy. What is is that fun to do film score work? Yeah, I did that with Questlove. He brought me in, and uh, that might, might have been one of the first things we did. Something like that. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I'd never done a film score to that point. The film that was on Netflix, you know, had all these people I knew in it. It was it was crazy, you know, people I was fans of. So, um, yeah, it was great, you know, being able to just take the reels and just watch over and over. And, and he gave me a lot of freedom, too. You know, he kind of just let me, he let me bring to the table what I was hearing. So it was nice to have that freedom and that, a uh, sense of trust. One of the best educators for anybody is seeing live music. Early on in your life, what live, ja what live jazz did you see that really left an impression on you? You know, Joe Sample uh, was from Houston, and um, he was probably he was the first jazz piano I ever saw live. I think it was five years old. And, um, yeah, he was the first, like, pianist I saw. And uh, he, he would come to Houston sometime and play. Well, we wasn't until he would play do fundraising, that type of thing. But yeah, I used to sit, like, in the front row. Like, me and my family used to sit there, and I would just be watching. Let me ask you this. I'm, I'm going to kind of enter kind of a, a fantastical realm here and say you, you get the Good. chance that you sit on the porch with yourself 20 years in the future, and you look over at your young self as an older guy and say, how was it? What was it like? What are you going to want to say to your older self about this ride up to this point? Uh, that's a great question, man. 
Uh, wow, you laid out all the questions. Uh, let's see. I mean, I'm hoping to say the ride is um, it gets easier. You know, I hope to have a family by then. You know, some kids, family, wife and kids. Just being able to uh, just keep pushing, hopefully pushing the music in a, in a newer direction, and still having my friends and my generation still creating and. You know, I try not to box myself in. You know, I want to keep performing and keep writing, you know, writing songs, songwriting, production. Let's just keep expanding my horizon. Right on. All my art type endeavors. Right on. That's great. So this is my final question for you, and it's this. Everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans. But you know who yeah. you are. You, 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 tell me, who do you think you are? I think it's constantly changing at this point. I mean, at the base, you know, if I think about it as a peer, that I try to be a good person, you know, you know, I try to uh, empathize, just treat people well, you know. If you can do something randomly nice for someone every day, you know, just some act of kindness, you know, at least get on the board for the day. But from there, you know, I hope, I think I can play, you know, I like the way I play piano a little bit. I don't know, that's not for me to decide, you know, it's for everybody else to decide. As long as I'm a good person, you know, I think everything else will fall into the place. Without a doubt. That's a great way to wrap everything up. James, thanks for taking some time out to me on jazz and opening up about the new album and all these projects in your life of music. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for the call. It was fun talking to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Houston, NYC, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to James for his time, his music, and putting all of that energy into pushing jazz forward. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time. Go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.